including here for this session of the World Hindu Congress. To uh, me, it is uh, my second uh, WLC. I attended the first one in, in Delhi. Uh, before I make my opening remarks, uh, let me introduce my fellow panelists here. Uh, we have uh, We have Dhanishini Ramachandran. She is uh, taking mediation, uh, which is one form of the, uh, the, the, the modern usage of uh, the medium of communication to the masses. She is uh, a founder and CEO of a startup, Mohus Lab, and she and the team have worked together with mediation and, and US technology. I, I won't go into details, she will explain what she does. And, it's basically an intervention in your lifestyle. Uh, uh, then, on my left is Adit Tapadia. Adit is the co-founder of myindiamakers.net. How many of you are familiar with it? So, we have some people who are familiar with it. And welcome, uh, Adit. Adit is... Uh, himself and uh, he is basically an engineer based in Texas and he has some interesting work. On my right is uh, Prerna Lausia and she is the CEO of Vahan, again a political magazine focused on Indian and Bharti and British politics. Uh, she received the Pride of India Award from the NRI Institute and the Bharat Nirman Award for a contribution to Bharat. Uh, and she pursues, pursues uh, she was previously a Goldman Sachs of the World moved to media. So welcome. And she will be talking about uh, what she does, which is including, she brought us uh, some new shows. And on my extreme right is Filmmaker, young filmmaker, uh, Ashe Dilip Jabrikar. Uh, he's been here in the US for 10 years and made films which have been shown around the world, including the Cannes Film Festival and the Maragada Film Festival in Philadelphia. He's won several awards, including the Best Short Film Award at Philadelphia International Film Festival in 2016, and so on. And he's just he's currently working on a feature film. So let's set it. I set the ball rolling on technology in media. For the first time in human history, we are living in a always on network society. Uh, there are roughly 5 billion of us, and that includes many children, in the remotest part of the world, some of the poorest people who for the first time through some means or the other are interconnected with each other. And the most prominent one being mobile phones. And why do I use the figure of 5 billion? Because there are 4 billion plus mobile phones in the world. And in many developing countries, one mobile phone is not the source of connectivity for one person but an entire family. I remember 20 years ago, I was attending a conference which set the rules for the digital, uh, for digital uh, uh, the medium itself uh, by, uh, in Geneva, held by the World Intellectual Property Organization. And at that, in that conference, one of the points which we debated on was this whole digital divide between the haves and the have-nots. And it was in as late as uh, 2000, 2002, the biggest challenge because the, the, the top 5, 10 uh, rich countries in the world had almost 10, 15, 20 times the connectivity and uh, media reach than the rest of the world. Fortunately, again, this is the first time which has happened in 
our human history that this in the last decade itself uh, there has been exponential progress and this I, I keep saying this at many forums and in my writing that society moves in a rapid progression but technology progresses in geometric progressions so it's always you know not 2 plus 2 but 2 into 2 and then 4 into 4 and so it multi the multiplier effect of technology is huge We've seen it in India. Uh, today, the number of people who are on, uh, you know, there are out of 240, 50 million households in the country, 118 million households are today connected from television in some form or the other. And out of this 150 million households, 150 million receive uh, cable television, which is not the terrestrial version of our we have uh, roughly 900 million plus mobile connections. And my sense is that we would have, uh, uh, if you take out uh, dual SIMs, etc., we have uh, about 600 million people with mobile phones. Unlike most countries, we have seen that in the last three, four years, the people accessing data which includes information and news and other forms of media on the mobile phone has actually increased exponentially and that has altered the entire uh, landscape or the mindscape, if I can use the correct term because the uh, ability of to manipulate uh, the mind has increased tremendously. In the earlier session, there was a whole thrust of debate on who controls the narrative. Unfortunately, and, and fake news, for example, if you ask me to look into the future, according to me, in five years, social media will be on its way out. Because there is a fatigue factor. Uh, you know, people are good because of the way technology intervenes, and there was a speed reference to algorithms being used by Facebook. But let's understand, today, on a mobile phone, any all of you which you have, and probably use Google, Google has AI built into it, already. All these larger and popular social media websites already have AI built into it. And somebody raised the question of machine learning in the previous session. But the fact is, in the next two or three years, the intervention of AI and machine learning, which is the next iteration of the internet, <coughs> which is in India, we'll see next year the implementation of the IPv6 protocol. <coughs> we are already talking about the auction of the, by next year again, you know, by end of 19 or early 20, the auction of the 5G spectrum. <coughs> All this now, it, these are very complex, I can offline discuss with anyone who is interested in what the technological uh, implications of this are. But the fact is, fake news is going to be as difficult uh, or as easy to generate as easy and uh, equally easy to, to block. So this debate becomes redundant. <coughs> the paucity of time uh, sort of stopped me from going into further detail, but the fact is, we are on the throes of a, a revolution in the next 10 years. By the end of the next decade, legacy media will be almost dead. It will survive as an esoteric pastime. I mean, that's, that's an absolute truth. So, this debate becomes redundant. <coughs> as I said, I'll be here to answer the questions. Now, let's open up this question to my panelists. On the, and today, so let's begin with you, Ashi. Thank you, Mr. Khanna. Uh, first, a disclaimer, I am a chemical engineer by training, so this is my first non-engineering conference. So, please bear with me, I might be a little slow and uh, in gathering my thoughts. So, uh, a quick introduction, my name is Ashay Dilip Tawdekar. Uh, I am a filmmaker. I have been making films for the last 10 years. I made 
short films and uh, recently I made a feature length movie called Shanks and I could distribute it online on Amazon Prime Video uh, because Amazon opened up their market, their distribution platform which has 65 million subscribers completely open to independent filmmakers like me and uh, I just wanted to give you some numbers and for a small time filmmaker like me these numbers are huge even though they might not see huge uh, my film on Amazon Prime Video has reached 80,000 views in US and UK and the trailer that I released on Facebook for that film uh, reached 400,000 views in first week of release so in my mind we are already in a revolution and internet and social media yes it is a game changer for consumption but it is a game changer for exhibition as well and uh, similarly I could uh, release my earlier short films too through Amazon Prime Video and uh, as and like Amazon there are other online platforms as well uh, but Amazon I, I keep talking about Amazon because uh, it is the it is one of the very well known platforms for uh, film distribution I just wanted to give my two cents on why it was possible why it was possible for a small filmmaker like me who made a film on an iPhone and a Canon PowerShot uh, handheld camera uh, to reach 80,000 people and 400,000 views on Facebook. So, I think decentralization of services and commodities made it possible. So, what does technology do? Is technology decentralizes services and commodities? I will give you some analogies. What happened in computer industry? So, in 1950s, there were mainframe computers accessible for a small set of people. Companies like Apple, Microsoft came and then they made computers available for everyone in the world, in each single person. And then, uh, because of that, that technology became decentralized. And uh, the usage of that technology became democratized. Same thing happened with telephone industry. So initially there were uh, telephone buildings where people used to connect you to uh, there were people that used to connect to different people through wires but then mobile phones came along and it decentralized that technology again democratized it. Uh, transportation industry uh, like Uber uh, it gave control of transportation to the person who is driving the vehicle not the person who owns uh, the transportation system. Similarly, I think, and now it is also entering into energy industry. I work in a clean energy company where we make uh, energy servers for uh, corporate customers where uh, you could uh, not depend on the grid, but you can have uh, the electricity that you want for yourself right, generated right in your backyard. So same thing I think happened for filmmaking and film distribution that uh, with internet, with the advent of internet and with the advent of social media uh, the decentralization of exhibition happened and it gave it, shifted the risk of distribution from the distributor to the content maker and that's why a content maker like me could directly approach Amazon make the film accessible to 65 million people and then have them see. Now obviously I don't have 65 million views because my film is probably not uh, that interesting to 65 million people. But it still has 80,000 views which is a huge number for a film like me. Another reason for this is I think that the, the I'll tell you a little bit about the film that I made. The film is called Shanks and the film is about a fictional chef that opens a Marathi fine dining restaurant in the US and makes it popular. So, uh, I tried taking the pangat we have in Marathi cuisine and breaking it down into an 11 course meal and explaining it on how Marathi food is consumed. And uh, I 
And obviously, I gave a human touch to it by having the chef story and then his, how his wife helped him and everything. But basically, the, the hero of the movie was food. And uh, what I thought that really connected with people was making it simple. Because we have a tradition of 5,000 years of almost everything. And we have, I mean, in my mind, we uh, kind of like overthink things. And we, we take pleasure in having things complex. And I really wanted to respect the ignorance of uh, people who do not know much about food in India. And I tried, in my own way, tried breaking it down and deconstructing the food so that even a simple uh, food like Varanbhat, how can it be eaten and how can it be served? So, it, I, I read this somewhere that root of resistance is lack of clarity. So, I tried making it more clear and more simple and I think that can hold true for any kind of message that we want to convey. If we respect the ignorance and then if we make it simple for people to understand, I think they will listen. So, uh, I'm just going to uh, leave you with a couple of thoughts that uh, while flying here, I was thinking about this in the flight. Uh, there are two, print, what, there are many principles of Hinduism, but I, uh, what I think stand true in this case is Aham Brahmasmi means I am the controller of my own destiny. I am the person who created me. So, that, that, that's what technology, streaming technology gives us, is I am the control of my own destiny. There is no one between me and what I do. And the second thing is Tattva Masi, that means you are it. In this, uh, in this age right now, in this age of technology, the only thing that stands between you and making films is you. Filmmaking is not a financial problem anymore. Filmmaking is not a content uh, development problem. You, my iPhone can do 4K recording. So, uh, it, I think the uh, if we think about these things, if we uh, make use of technology that's available to us, then we could go a very long way. All we have to do is just open, keep our eyes open, and then make the message as simple as possible. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ashok. My only advice to you is uh, just mere reach is not good enough. So it is monetization of that reach. So, you know, while we should be complimenting for using a medium like Amazon Prime with 80,000 views, let me just tell you yesterday, uh, an Indian website which you, streams uh, or, or a YouTube uh, uh, site which streams Indian songs uh, run by T series has become the number one uh, YouTube channel in the world with 65 million uh, followers is it at in worldwide. So the numbers are large. You learn to monitor. And I will, I will we'll discuss it offline because that's now. Can, can I quickly comment on this? Shanks is the only film in which I made money, and Shanks is the only film. No, I wish. And, and no, I recovered money. Absolutely, you have the potential to do it hundred times. That's what I'm saying. Okay? So that should be your next challenge. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Prerna, and uh, as I said, she is uh, uh, come from the world of finance into India, and she will share her experiences. Yeah. 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 Namaste, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Prana Bharadwaj. I was formerly in North Siam, but I recently got married. And just to give you a bit of background about myself, I've been involved in media since the day I was born. My parents have a radio in London, New Sound Radio, 92 FM. And since the age of 16, I've been writing articles about India and international politics. I'm the Joint Secretary of the Overseas Friends of BJP UK, the Vice Chair of the City Hindus Network, and I've been a councillor candidate for the Conservative Party. But despite qualifying as a barrister and working for Goldman Sachs, I was always fascinated by politics and the media, and in particular the injustices that incorrect or biased reporting carries. We've heard about this already in the first session. 
But what sparked my outrage was our Honourable Prime Minister, when he was Chief Minister of Gujarat, the amount of incorrect, biased, and irresponsible articles that were printed about him. If we could go to the second slide, I'm sure we all know about the Guardian and how left-wing they are. But just to give you a few examples, they called Narendra Modi G a Hindu supremacist, saying that he's anti-Muslim and he could be dangerous for India. And in the third slide, an article in the Evening Standard, which is very popular in London, the writer Amor Rajan said that he's an Islamophobic chief minister. So two examples there, and even though this was in 2013, sadly now in 2018, there's no shortage of biased newspapers and magazines that are out not to defame our Honourable Prime Minister, but also our great religion. And it was this that led me to leave my job in Goldman Sachs. And towards the end of last year, I started my own magazine, Vahan, to put this wrong to right, or to try and put this wrong to right, should I say. And a lot of people did warn me that print media is dying, there's no point starting another magazine, there's so many magazines out there. But despite this, I still wanted to continue. And that's because, with regards to the UK especially, there's no voice for those who don't want to stick to the mainstream narrative. And I know we've heard mainstream banded about a lot. But the mainstream narrative is derogatory towards Hindus, and those to that seek to preserve Hinduism. If we look at the Honourable Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh, Yogi Adityanath, and Swami Ramdev, they're both always targeted in the media, not only for their religious beliefs, but for their religious attire. And if we think about other religions, they would never ever be criticised for what they wear, for what they believe, how they practise their religions, but we're always criticised for it. If we could go to slide four. The New York Times wrote about Yogi Adityanath last year and said that He's a leader of a temple known for militant Hindu supremacist traditions. He's got an army of youths and that we're preparing for a religious war. I don't know about you guys, but I haven't seen this army of youths and this religious war that we're preparing for, but yet the New York Times is able to publish things like that. And if we could go to the next slide. There was an article only last week in the Wall Street Journal which ridiculed Baba Ramdev and yoga. And it, even though the article was about misappropriation of culture, she managed to throw in Hindu nationalists, even low caste Dalits and Muslims featured in the article. And then towards the end of the article, she actually said there was no evidence of yoga, and actually it came from Danish gymnastics, which we all know is another thing that's absurd. But yet, writers continue to write these things in print media. But there is no doubt that print media isn't as popular as it once was, and that's due to the advancement of technology. As we've heard, lots of people are using their mobile phones, even for this conference, instead of using the hard paper copy of the schedule, we're all looking at the app because it's there and it's easy for us to see. All we have to do is open something on our smartphone, and we've got an abundance of articles instantaneously delivered to us. An article in Forbes said that digital advertising has a far greater reach so advertisers would rather spend their money on digital advertising, which we've also heard, instead of advertising in print media. And the digital sphere also allows for a greater monitoring of data. On the Vahan website, I can see which articles have been read the most and from which global location. You can't do this with print media. And, so, and since the start of the internet era in 2000, the Audit Bureau of Circulations has said that the decline in print media is 55%. If we could go to the next slide we can see that the ad revenue for news brands and magazines have steadily declined. And in the next slide, it also shows us about national newspaper ad revenue in the UK, so that's continuing to, continuing to decline as well. Social media networks such as Facebook, Twitter and WhatsApp mean that news can be spread more quickly, and people have begun to use these as news forums instead of actually looking at print media or a newspaper. All too often, we've heard this before as well in the earlier session, that these mediums include fake news and misinformation. All it takes is one false article to be posted to a few WhatsApp groups, and that news can become true or even cause riots. Sadly, we have seen this in India, where mobs have lynched 25 people after reading false rumours spread on WhatsApp. People believe that those who were lynched were child abductors, and this is based on a WhatsApp video. But this WhatsApp video was a child safety film from Pakistan, so not even from India, and it was designed to create awareness. And we're all part of these WhatsApp groups, we're forever deleting videos and pictures, but now we have to be really careful of what we're reading and whether it's actually true or not. And India is WhatsApp's largest market, with 200 million users. 
A 2018 report from the Reuters Institute at the University of Oxford shows that WhatsApp is becoming an increasingly dominant news sharing platform across Latin America. So we can see the dangers of this, that everyone's using WhatsApp to share news and information. And the government of India did try and combat these dangers of fake news. And they hold it, and they're trying to hold those that are disseminating it responsible. A press release by the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting stated that accreditation of a journalist, both television and print, can be cancelled or annulled if the news reported by him or her is found to be fake, something that I think was a really noble move. But unfortunately, this was manipulated again by the Congress party, Ahmed Patel, and journalists. And these journalists, no doubt, had their own fake stories and agendas that might be put into jeopardy. So Prime Minister Narendra Modi then directed that the press release be withdrawn and that the matter should be addressed only in the Press Council of India. If we can go to the next slide. WhatsApp is being, has been using print media and other platforms to educate people of fake news. As we can see from the slide here, print media does hold some weight as big corporations are looking to use print media to spread important information. As with WhatsApp and other forms of digital media, news channels also play a huge role. We heard about Al Jazeera as well lately, which can, but not only Al Jazeera, there's other news forums that use fake footage and that, that can be twisted. And we saw this with the alleged killing of the Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar. It was later discovered that the footage shown some of them were images from Bangladesh and even Rwanda. If we could go to the next slide, here's some examples. So the picture is shown from Bangladesh and someone also tweeted a picture of a, a little baby in Rwanda using this as propaganda for the massacre of um, Rohingya Muslims. But actually, Amnesty International had gathered evidence that insurgents from a Rohingya Muslim armed group killed scores of Hindu civilians. However, this was largely omitted from both the print and media channels and there was no huge outcry that was witnessed. So with the dangers of news being manipulated on social media, online and on news channels, one can then think that print media could be a more safe and reliable medium of news. Print media is more permanent. Once the story has been printed, it's out there and it can't be deleted like a tweet or an online post. Thus writers can be held to account more so than what's momentarily read or shown on news channels. But regardless of whether print media or online media gain more importance in current and future times, we all have a moral duty to print and show the world the truth. As this forum is called Truth is Supreme, we should take up this battle to ensure that the supreme truth gets out there and not all this biased fake news that we're, meet that we're reading today. I'd like to end with the next slide with a quote from Swami Vivekananda, who spoke here 125 years ago. Had it not been for these horrible demons, human society would be far more advanced than it is now. But their time has come. And I fervently hope that the bell that tolled this morning in honour of this convention may be the death knell of all fanaticism, of all persecutions with the sword or with the pen, and of all uncharitable feelings between persons wending their way to the same goal. Let's all take it upon ourselves to end the persecution of Hindus by the pen and the wider media. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prerna. Uh, you put up a very spirited uh, uh, case uh, for uh, the Hindu cause and for what you term as fake news. As I said, that I believe that uh, in what Prophet Taker actually really said before the session, before the session, that actually to change the narrative is more important than to battle on social media. Because social media, sooner than later, because the way technology is developed, we can and hopefully will, within the next year or two, develop tools to, to be able to filter out this news. So, my honest advice is that please help change the narrative so that you are not getting disturbed by what is appearing in, on The Guardian or the, or the Wall Street Journal. It is how do we change that discourse? So we move on now to our next uh, panelist, and uh, this is Adit Kapadia, co-founder, as I said, of Mind, Make, My Mind Makers, uh, uh, which is a 
website mindmakers.net and he specializes in podcasts and analysis based out of the US. Uh, thank you everyone, uh, thank you Arunji, thank you everyone for coming in. Uh, sessions after breaks are always tricky, so I'm glad to see a great crowd after the break. Uh, that gives us confidence. But uh, actually what uh, Arunji alluded to uh, after Breda's uh, uh, very ins incisive take was um, finished was about uh, setting a narrative. And my topic that I was given was uh, community outreach via online media and podcasting. And I want to highlight uh, why online media and the advent of online media has, it's almost spearheaded the, um, the challenge of changing the narrative or, for, or of addressing that issue. Um, amidst an expanding Bharatiya community globally, uh, there is a new group of people worldwide that have risen together to provide platforms for their side of the narrative uh, to be presented in a balanced way. Now, one could agree or disagree with it, but at least these voices which were not being heard earlier are coming out more and more. Uh, for far too long in India and in the West, as was put, put, uh, put in by the previous panel, we had media outlets with a very misinformed view of uh, many traditions and so forth. And that, that was reflected in the coverage and it resulted in a very ill-informed narrative about India. But this has changed in the last few years. It started, of course, with social media busting a few myths and stuff, but it's galvanized after online media has taken center stage. Uh, what started as a movement to reclaim the narrative where only one kind of voices were being heard has resulted in there being more portals and more outlets talking about uh, India in a way that you know, people sitting in the room would agree or, or disagree, but at least there are more and more voices out there. We are fast getting, we are fast getting to the point where more people in the world will have access to more digital content, and that's where online media will play a huge role in advancing that. When we started Mindmakers in 2015, uh, one of the first things we decided to explore was, was the global connect between the members of the community in different parts of the world. I mean, just look around the room and you'll see how many people from different parts of the world have come here to attend the, uh, the World Hindu Conference. And we expected po uh, positive responses and people to react to it, but the scale of the response positively surprised us. Uh, there were many core issues being faced by people in Europe, in the United States, and India, and there was some sort of commonality to some issues. And by giving it a platform to express those concerns on a, on a global scale, it, the, we made sure that there was a cohesive effort in place to address these. Now, we're not the only ones, and there are many other efforts taking place to address this as well, and I, I say more the merrier, the more the merrier. Online portals have helped bridge the gap between countries and people. I take the example of several efforts like the India Pride project. Uh, a very fine effort about bringing the uh, idols, stolen idols, back to India, started uh, by uh, my friends Anurag Saxena, Vijay, and others. Uh, this is a cause that people across the world, Hindus across the world, relate to. And whereas some sections of the print and the TV media might, were not interested in giving it coverage, online media did amplify the voice and gave it, uh, uh, gave it a huge platform. And that has only helped their efforts. And this is this. This is, I mean, the cause is so much, uh, so well respected in India that the government and the opposition both are uh, supporting it. So that tells you uh, how it's progressing and how online media is reaching. Not only has uh, online media revolutionized the writing and the video side of things, it has significantly challenged the hegemony of TV news as well. Now, we, uh, Jackie very eloquently said that no one wants to watch five head, just head, five people just shouting, having a shouting match on TV every night. And that is, you know, slowly seems to be the consensus where the TV news viewership is declining as well. And that's where, in the last 10 years, a new, another medium has completely revolutionized the industry that is podcasting. Now, one could, uh, one could also say online radios, podcasting, there are various uh, various portals which talk about it, which have discussions. But I want to focus on podcasting and, you know, we can have a discussion about other uh, ideas as well. The platform of podcasts gave people an opportunity to have a discussion about their point of view without, being, without it being within the frameworks of uh, uh, TV news debate, which was heavily tilted towards one side and one ideological discourse. This gave a global platform for people to have discussions which could be consumed by the community across the globe. The biggest US, USP for podcasts, or online radio for that matter, was that the equal access that it gave to people to talk about issues which were close to them. They were not just driven by commercial ratings or TRP, but they were, they were, uh, they were uh, what a belief in causes and ideas. 
This, combined with the reach of online portals, has resulted in a new framework for Hindus across the globe to get their ideas and views, uh, and it's growing exponentially. When we started uh, podcasting on Mind Makers in 2015, uh, there was a dearth of Indo-American news coverage on the podcast side, uh, especially uh, with a focus on India. And three years and 180 episodes, or I've lost count, I guess, later, um, it's significantly changing. From being the first and the, in some aspects the only ones covering these issues, we are slowly seeing more and more people talking about it. There, were, there are attempts being made by various portals and journalists to come into their portal. Uh, some of them have been successful, uh, some of them have not been successful, but they are still not claiming that they have not, have been, they have not been successful. So in the last decade, or even a few years ago, podcasts, especially in the Bharatiya context, were a rather unknown commodity. But that is changing rapidly. And that is the real story. You know, the West had the radio audience, and India also had a radio audience, but rarely on the news space or the political space. Uh, can we get the same uh, audience to podcasting? You've seen that in the West, uh, a lot of uh, people from the radio have, uh, st have started listening to podcasts. And what has happened is those by putting those podcasts on, it's expanded their reach globally. Rather than a person driving in a car or a person sitting in uh, one city being listened to it, the whole world or the whole country can listen to it at the same at the same time. And there are of course, I mean there's of course some podcasts that have a formal structure. But for the most part, I think one of the biggest USPs of the format and stuff is irreverence. Uh, the ability to have an informal conversation about serious topics and yet have it in a very irreverent fashion is what sets it apart from conventional TV debates. I always joke with my uh, co-founders that we can talk uh, in part one about the strategic 2 plus 2 dialogue that India and US have been having and in part two we can talk about Mr. Khanna's songs and Panchanda's music and both can be done you know, uh, as a different um, in formats and that's what the podcast brings to you. Um, it, there are many issues like the California textbook issue, uh, misrepresentation of, of Hindus on TV shows like you saw in Quantico and others. Um, there were hit jobs and news outlets, fake news, as Priya said, that online media and podcasting have managed to counter. But they slowly but surely we are seeing an agenda setting and a narrative which is being built where there are there are stories being done um, of, on, on various, various aspects of culture, uh, foreign policy, historical issues, and so forth. Uh, this panel itself is a testament to the changing paradigm. We have voices from different parts of the world talk about various issues that affect us all, but there is almost a sort of similarity in which we see it. As the cliche goes, change is the only constant thing in this world, and that applies to media more than any other industry in the world. The change has slowly begun. Uh, but we have a long ways to go uh, in terms of getting reportage and stuff like that. Uh, can we get there? Well, I remain a hopeful person and I'm sure most of you will remain too. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adit. Uh, I think uh, one of the points which you made, and I fully agree with it, with it I don't know what uh, Jaggi said in his uh, uh, session earlier, because I was a brief team. Uh, the fact is, we are as a, you know, a certain percentage of people giving too much importance to this televised uh, or the broadcast news uh, in India. The fact is, the average viewership every day of television in India is roughly 300 to 400 million people. And only 30 to 50 million people watch news in all the 22 languages it is telling us. The English language broadcasts are not even crossing 10 million at an optimum level. So what are they debating about? I mean, why are we getting scared and bogged down by these people who no longer are shifting the debate? I, I think that is something which we should all be concerned with, that are we ready for tomorrow? Because we are constantly battling, battling with our yesterdays. Uh, he, uh, Adit is doing, uh, you know, he mentioned about this great project to be handed out of Singapore where, where they're trying to help recover lost idols from uh, various temples, etc. in India, which have been stolen and smuggled out. And this was a project which started as a voluntary effort and now that is snowballing into a major, uh, you know, globalized. Uh, and it has resulted in the return of, of uh, many, many idols back to India. So yes, uh, this uh, 
the technology is a great force multiplier and we need to harness it. Uh, one my, one, of, one uh, small comment before I hand the mic to Dhanushree. Uh, you know, we are slowly coming into the age. It's already started, but you will see it accentuate very fast and probably in the next four or five years will become the norm and not the exception, is customization of news. People will use or access news in any form, in the manner which they want to be informed. So if I want to be informed about what the Hindu community is doing worldwide, even I today, I can customize my news and, and get that information. But it's, it's required effort. But in the next three or four years, that will become the norm. That's the way you will actually be informed. So the, the threat, what you are doing, needs to be more focused on what is going to happen in the next three or four years, not on the historical perspective, which is important to create a context to news and information. But we always need to anticipate and that's been one of our failings. We as a community start battling with, a, with provo you know, immediate provocation rather than prepare a counter narrative which will prevail in the years to come. So now let's see, for example, you mentioned about yoga being talked about some Czech dance over there. The, the writer was saying that it actually originates from Danish gymnastics. Danish gymnastics, but the fact is that the UN has accepted uh, it as uh, you know yoga and, and created the International Yoga Day. A lot of credit goes to Prime Minister Modi on this. And I'm glad um, uh, Ranishree is here with us. She is running uh, a meditation uh, and, and uh, International Week of Yoga, which she was just celebrating through an organization in Boston. So, we talk about mass uh, yoga. And that's one of the non profits that I'm associated with. Hello, everyone. So, we have heard a lot this afternoon about how media is all manipulated, and some of it we already know new, and some of it is probably new to us. You know what it seems like? All those demons and um, you know a kasur who could just eat and eat and eat and you couldn't do anything in front of him. And then there was Ravan in mythology with ten heads and you couldn't kill Ravan. This media thing kind of seems to me something like that. There is an invisible demon and it's so powerful and you cannot touch it. It's funded so well that we don't know where it comes from. Maybe we know but we can't do anything about it. And as soon as we think everything's okay, it's whisper something in our children's ears and everybody we know and suddenly Hindus are bad, right? And so, despite of being educated in media and advertising and working in it, this demon was a little further away from, from reality for, for us at least and it became very close when um, Sanjay Kolji and Abhay Astanaji um, held a meeting um, about media uh, for, for World Hindu Congress and so how do we get people engaged with this, Hindus in the US and, and non-Hindus in the US. And so we all started telling all kinds of reasons, right? They are unavailable, we don't know what they read and we don't have access to where they go and find news and, and Abhayati said, well, that's the challenge, so who's going to take it? And that was that, right? So I went to work and I spoke to Adrian, Adrian Van Sweden, who's been sitting here quietly and we have not talked about him, but he, he's our secret, you know, he's the answer to all the questions that we've been talking about. <laughs> So um, he's a techno geek, he's an SEO geek actually, he can totally SEO you to be the most important person in the world overnight, I can guarantee that. <laughs> so, um, so we talked about so what is going on and what can be done and we are today going to show you something for the first time, we have never shown anybody yet, we are launching something here. Um, so with that I'm going to give it to Adrian, he's going to explain the process, how we... Okay, can we... Show the video maybe? Because, yeah, slide number three. Well, we already talked a lot about the misrepresentation of Hindu world and Hindu values. Um, we we identified two breakdowns. Block the temples and worship me. So, yeah, so just quickly, we identified two breakdowns. And one is the news that people see that they get basically shoved in their face every day. And the other is when people actually start researching um, 
things like, like they want to know more and they Google um, for information, they find um, very inaccurate information. And so basically there's, for a non-Hindu who doesn't have access to authentic sources, it's almost impossible to find out what, what Hinduism really is and um, what it really represents. Um, yeah, so this is a video we shot at Harvard Square in Cambridge on a Sunday afternoon and we asked people what they know about Hinduism and these are some of the questions. Basically, the, the, we edited out the worst ones, so... <laughs> yeah, can you play it? Black temples and worship me, but that's all I know. Hinduism is more of a lifestyle than a religion, but it can be both. Very vague. Uh, Ganesha is uh, an elephant god. Uh, I think I may know that from The Simpsons. And they have like certain days where it's the sa Sabbath day and where they fast and they do different things in effect. Okay, <laughs> so you see there's a, we have a huge problem. Um, I think, yeah, we, we talked enough about the problem. Let's talk about like what our solution looks like. Um, can you go to slide number... Oh, oh, you can... Okay, sorry, Dana Shri wants to cover something actually about the problem. <laughs> So that the, the solution looks more charming, yeah, than the strategy. Um, so yeah, uh, we figured out a lot of filters that are used by news channels, and um, just so that we know what exactly we need to do. And, and Prina here did an amazing job showing uh, so many of those things. So we are not even going to get into what you know what news channels are showing and what we need to see. But um, if you can go to slide number four, please. This is somewhat like we see, you know, through filters, um, but it looks like something that's burning, something that's going to kill you, something that's completely fragmented, um, and just tremendous effort to connect weird dots um, around the world, like news that that start with Asian women abuse actually begin with um, Hindu domestic abuse victims, and so it's it's very easy to see. Um, if we can go to slide number five, please. And then we figured out the second breakdown, uh, where despite of all this, if somebody manages to get interested in, in Indian culture or you know Hindu knowledge, say for example yoga, which is very common for people to get to the roots of, right? So um, one most popularly Google uh, literature, Patanjali Yoga Sutras, it's hundreds of years old and we all know it. Um, and so we started looking at what are people reading about it, and we found some top results, and two of those top results were these writers, Bon Giovanni and uh, Ralph Griffith. And so we, we looked at those translations, and they're not just below average, but they're completely ridiculous. If anybody reads just one page of the, that book, they're going to think Hindus are crazy. They have no idea what they're doing, and definitely yoga is not for them. And so we started looking at who those writers are, and Turns out that Bon Giovanni is really a ghostwriter. There is no record of him anywhere. The website that sells those books on Amazon actually belongs to a Spanish uh, cartoon artist. And um, there's nothing more than that. And then Ralph Griffith, who is among many of uh, such people who came to India in the 1800s on a scholarship given by uh, Mr. Bowden, who was an East India Company officer in, um, in India for some time. He wrote all his estate in a will that sends people to India to translate Sanskrit in a way that discourages people from reading Sanskrit, actually. And you can see, except of its will over there, the whole um, purpose of this activity is so that it's, it'll be easier for British people then to convert Indians to Christian religion. And so when we started looking at these details, because we didn't want to just believe that the demon is out there and not knowing where he lives or what happens, actually, we wanted to know Where's the house? What are we actually dealing with? And and then the solution was very easy, and it was in front of us. I say easy because now there's little clarity. It's still very difficult, and we all will have to work on it. But um, with that, if we can go to the next slide. Hello. Oh, so our solution is Hindu Media Bureau. And what Hindu Media Bureau is, is um, a voice, a voice of reason, a voice of truth 
that it's going to be louder than all the crap out there, basically. Um, I think, yeah, there's there's different ways to tackle the problem. One is you can you can go out and tell people that they're wrong, that they shouldn't do what they're doing. Um, you can try to uh, hope uh, or just um, never mind. I think, in, in my view, the best way to do it is just to be to be first, to be louder, to be the one that's heard instead of the other ones. And that's what we intend to do with the Media Bureau. Um, the base, the ground zero of the Media Bureau is a website. It's the next slide. Um, and an organization to create content. So we need, we need two things. We need to reach people and we need to have the content to, um, what do you call it, persuade them. Um, this is an, a, an idea of the structure that, that we are creating and for a large part already have created. It's, um, it has eight limbs and it's, uh, there's a bureau part of it. The bureau part works to, uh, to create authentic translations. There's a media to create uh, items, uh, videos and, and text. Um, there's news, there's opinion. Um, we're building a platform. We're going to have a council to make sure that we keep our direction going. Um, advertising, we can we can work that out. Um, and there's a lot of production going on. Um, yes. That's okay. Um, so the bureau part is something that's new. The rest of the part probably actually everyone knows. Um, so we want to create. Um, and, and it's already almost done, um, and we'll show the next slide, please. So the Bureau's job would be to uh, look out for any bad translations in, in you know, literature or websites, anywhere we can find, and then help them correct those. If it's a really innocent mistake, they will. And if it's not, if there is another agenda, then we're ready to fight it legally. Um, so we're looking for you know all kinds of support if you have expertise in Sanskrit or any other Indian languages. Um, you know, please, you're welcome to be part of the Bureau. Um, and then, that's our website, so we recommend going there every now and then. Uh, we have created a poll, and this is really the first hand of what you would want to see how Hindus are represented in, um, in media. And we want to, we've been getting so much of feedback from, from people as making it more relevant to the youth and making it, uh, you know, as efficient as mainstream media is, and that's another thing. It's going, going to be a newsroom um, in Boston, so um, you know we will contact you for your opinion on anything that happens in the U.S. And we need a Hindu voice, so be ready for a call anytime. And with that, um, we launch Hindu Media Bureau. Thank you. Chair of Hindu Studies, the first Vivekananda chair here at the University of Chicago, the 
My question is about our future generation, like our kids who goes to school. I know, like one of the things I've seen, I have two kids, that in their school they don't talk about Christianity unless they go to Christian schools. But we try to propagate our Hinduism agenda in their mind, instill that just because we want them to, you know, grow their future and live like proud Hindus. Now they want to just live like human beings. I mean, they're next generation. Indians. And of course it is a problem for us also who has come as first generation that we don't want to be called Hindus. So it is a very difficult situation for us. I'm asking questions. Hold on. It is a very difficult situation for us to live in the environment where we have friends who feel very proud Hindus and we also have friends who say we are non-Hindus but we are equally proud human beings. And sometimes it becomes very difficult to live in that kind of boat. What is the what, what? It's a very difficult situation in this kind of scenario here. So what do we do in this kind of scenario? What do we propagate to our kids, or what do we propagate? It? It's, it's not like a bad agenda, but they have their own perspective. We have our own perspective. One thing is that this session is about technology in India. So I think let's concentrate on the second part of the session, which are handling this age. A session going on education. Which is no, no, this is not about education, it's about how technology is actually. Okay, move on. I can answer in one line, support us, and we will help you do that. <laughs> <laughs> Can you please just ask a question? So, my question is for Dharushi. Like, uh, recently in, the, uh, in California, one of the school boards, uh, they, there was a school fight against them uh, regarding yoga. And they went to the court, and the court said, like, you know, so one person can be uh, named as uh, apple sauce, crisp cross apple sauce, something like that. So in a way, the court is institutionalizing this and patenting it as, as something else when when Padmasan. So how would you counter that? So and another, another one, uh, since you are you want to tackle the misinformation on the internet. So I was checking Wikipedia today and. Uh, uh, so there is a strike uh, band called in India for uh, Savarn. So this uh, definition of Varna, we have the four standard Varnas over there. So they have created a fifth one, which is called uh, uh, Dalits S-E-N-S-T, which is, S-E-S-T is basically English terminology. 
So again, like you know, how will you deal, deal with that? Because yes. uh, in we get your questions. Sure. Yeah. So it's a, my simple answer to this is Wikipedia is a public uh, interface. You can yourself go and connect. It doesn't happen because I mean you get kicked out of the network. You can add. You can. You can. No. Just, no. It can. It, it does. Please understand. No, you are not. No. You can create another page. You can create another page that says. You can create another page that says whatever you're reading is a joke and send it to your friends, make it more popular, and that will force Wikipedia to take an action. Have you tried it, sir? Not challenging another page. Not challenging another. But creating your own. I'm telling you, it's very much possible. So, about the other source question has been, right? Amaji, who do you want next question? Okay. We weren't done with this one, actually. So about the yoga posture and the lawsuit, right? Well, if you realize this is a fight, it's never going to be won. See, my dad is a lawyer. You go in court, something happens wrong, you get a wrong decision, what do you do? Do you complain about it? There is no option. Then we file another suit, and someday we will be able to prove it, and someday they're gonna lose it. Because what we are saying is true, right? If we have that faith, then there's no way, it's a hard fight. Nobody said it was going to be very easy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, can you please, uh, the, the gentleman there. No, behind you. Thank you. No, uh, behind you. He was asking you first. I have a question, you know, how important it is to have a grand Hindu narrative even in the media? Because there are various groups, various ideologies, various opinions in India and across the globe. Uh, should there be a grand narrative about Hinduism which should be projected collectively across media? I, I, I think this was answered in the previous session that the whole concept of plurality stems out of Hinduism. So there, there cannot be one grand narrative. All of us will have different ways to express the same truth as long as we speak the truth. One second. Hello? Yeah. Yes, uh, Sushi. Let, let, let me talk about this with us. Uh, Anybody asking question, if you can ask to a specific speaker so that you can get and once the answer is done, if at all you have still question, you can take offline afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes. Namaste, my name is Jairaj. Uh, it's not a question but an addition to Aditji's uh, uh, information. He gave the internet radio. I'm also, uh, this is from my experience too. I'm running a radio for over four years. It's a Dharma radio. It's in one language. So I'm giving this information to everyone. This is something you can do very cheap. I'm spending less than ten dollar per month, and it's reaching out to several thousand. It's only it's a Malayalam language. So you get out. This is my recommendation to everybody. Start something like this. If you need information, you can contact me. It's very simple, you don't need any sophisticated uh, devices, it's very simple, that's it. Thank you, Chair. Sticking to the technology issue, one of the vagaries of technology is the fragmentation of audiences. Because technology is making it cheaper and easier, people are consuming media at different times of the day, in different genres, in different manners as they please. Now, when audiences get fragmented into small clusters in different time zones and different genres, how do you build a campaign? How do you build awareness in short possible time and how expensive it is going to get in order to gather audiences across genres, across media, across time zones? And is this going to be a task which is getting increasingly more expensive, more difficult? and probably impossible to achieve or is there some kind of a way to still sweep audiences into one specific uh, to disseminate information and getting into uh, getting to connect them with the information well i think uh, there will be several takes on this
So everything's way more specialised now. With the magazine, we had to sort of determine whether it should be in the UK, whether it should be India, whether it should be politics. And to reach a broad spectrum, I think, is a lot harder now than it was before. When you say it, or it, or it's a now the content consumption is on demand. I think it's a blessing for an exhibitor like me. But I'm running a campaign 24-7, 365, and then I'm sweeping audiences all over the world in all time zones. So I really think that it's it's a it, it's a blessing for at least for a filmmaker like me that anyone can watch my film at any time. Uh, to answer your question specifically, uh, Sushil, in the short term, yes, it's going to be more difficult and uh, more expensive. But in the very immediate future, it will become very easy because everything, I am not talking about some distant future. Please understand this is going to start happening in, all over the world in the next two or three years. Is customization. Uh, there was a term used for this many years ago which said personalized segmentation of media. So once you are able to convey a certain message into a certain audience which may transgress or digress from your core audience, you can still reach the, the intended audience or as large a universe as you want because of this segmentation and customization, which will be possible technologically through algorithms, AI, and several other technologies. Okay. Uh, namaste. My, uh, my name is Shreya. Uh, my, my question is for Tanish D. It's about the Hindu Media Bureau. So, is the objective to fight? fake news alone or is it also about uh, content that is not authentic like it's kind of spiritual texts that have been mistranslated i'm a content producer i produce i produce mahabharata ramayana pachatantra all that in reading the original and translating it because i believe a lot of content out there is not authentic so is does him how does somebody like me how does somebody like me reach out to hindu media bureau Sure, yeah. Sriram, I know you. We've been in um, Sanskrit partnership here quite a few times and I've seen you perform your stories, so you're amazing. Um, so yeah, the objective, the two parts that you said, I don't really see them as two parts. You know, we cannot just keep protecting and not creating, or we cannot just keep creating and then not protecting. So it's, it's both. Um, together and getting in touch with us is as easy as writing to info at newmediavideo.org um, or coming to Boston. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and first of all, thank you very much for starting Hindu News Bureau. I so need it. So my question is to reach out to the mainstream, not just Hindus talking to Hindus, but taking our message of Hinduism to mainstream. Do you have a business plan where you create a network? Uh, what is your business plan in that direction? Do you want in terms of time or money or reach or? Is there a specific thing you want to know? What I was thinking was a network where all apps can be created and then they could be shared widely. Right. So is that included in your business plan? See now, um, the, as, long as, as much as the mainstream media is intelligent, it's very dumb as well. As much as you, I mean, you keep, keep using the buzzwords and they, they pick up, it's a very automated process. So you, you send a news to Reuters and they put it all over the world. You use like something like Modi and it will be printed in New York Times. So it's very easy, we don't need a business plan, they make it so easy for us. But yeah, we in this year we want to be in the US and in, in another two years we want to go to the neighboring countries where we have more Hindu population like Canada. And then, um, go for it. Namaste, Shushuji spoke about fragmentation of audiences, but um, through social media we see a lot of uh, echo chambers forming. Uh, how can we stop that and um, form with the one side or the other of the solution to it? I think one of the <clears throat> one of the solutions to that is to highlight like if if you read something that's probably not suited your narrative, you highlight it and rebut it effectively. Uh, another solution is to call that person and have a dialogue, discussion, or a debate with them, and you know, spread it out more and more. Because if if we do not dispel that, and if we just keep on uh, saying, oh, like keep patting each other's back, we're never going to get there. So I think challenging that narrative is very important.
like us, such as Black Panther was black. Why can't we get something like this, given we've got 1.3 billion audience out in Hollywood? Several films made, unfortunately, not enough audience out here. So, uh, you know, I can give you a list offline. So it's not that attempts are not being made. Even now, there are some films being made, uh, but it's very difficult to reach out to because the distribution and marketing costs are so prohibitive. And exhibition is, you know, in spite of democratization, a large film requires a lot of money, and the monetization is. Uh, Uh, I, I will answer the question. We can talk after this panel. I just want to understand what you mean by Hindu film. So what I mean is just anything we can get about. We have been talking about the audience. We have been talking about the content. Uh, I would like to specifically ask because I teach uh, to the media students. I work with the media. I present Sangha Point of View in the electronic media. The, what I see is, you know, there is a uh, there is a urge of participation because the news is opinionated. There is a urge for participation, and for anybody and everybody. That's why idea like citizen journalists get popular, or internet uh, journalists, or Twitter journalists. You know, is a completely different category. How we can use technology? instead of making it a four or five panel discussion, more democratized and still with same audiovisual impact. Is, the, is that a possibility in future that many panelists who want to participate in that discussion for say the next 25 years, time doesn't matter. But one particular format is already posted and after that many people audiovisually can participate. In so that's, that's, the, that's the reason of all blogs. There are several blogs today on the net where you can participate in, in such a discussion. But if you're talking about visual news also, Google Hangouts and stuff. Right, that's a blog. But we, we've had like one other ten panelists who join in and they would put their point of view and they would. So that is happening like as a should happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. 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 Uh, session also we uh, Jaggi mentioned about the media narrative or the bias right and more than the more important than the fake news so how do you intend to use technology to identify that maybe not straight away but in the future rather than using manpower uh, there are patterns that you can easily identify um, the, the algorithm that the other side uses you can use that too and so there are many ways to do that. And it's not just about fighting it, but it's flooding the media with good content. And so there is no place for bad media. So uh, I would like with this uh, final question answer, I would like to answer that this session is concluded.